Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's lecture forum. The title of today's lecture forum is The Struggles of the Filipino People During the Influenza Pandemic of 1918 to 1919, a revisit to the mother of all pandemics under the American colonization. I'm your guest speaker for today. I'm Dr. Dave Elijah Kicho Dada. I'm a licensed medical doctor and a graduate of the University of the Philippines, Manila, Behavioral Sciences degree program. I would like to thank University of the Philippines, Cebu, College of Social Sciences for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share to you a very timely topic about the history of pandemic and how we can apply this to our modern day COVID-19 pandemic. All right, so let's start by discussing the lecture outline. So first, we're going to discuss the general history of influenza pandemic 1918 to 1919. We're also going to talk about the struggles of the Filipino people during the influenza pandemic, application of influenza pandemic history in relation with today's pandemic. Okay, so let's start with the general history of influenza pandemic from 1918 to 1919. So what happened in the world during influenza pandemic? So this actually was a global public health crisis. By most estimates, more than half of the global population became ill and at least 50 million individuals died in the pandemic. So that's a lot. No? And usually, unlike the regular seasonal flu, which tends to victimize mostly the elderly and the sick, the virus, the flu virus of 1918 killed mostly young adults. So actually, uh, that's ironic, right? Because usually the influenza would tend to affect the older age group. But for this scenario, you know, um, it's actually the young adults that were actually affected by this condition. 99% of excess deaths were among people below 64 years old. And in most countries, mortality peaked in the 20 to 34 years of age. The disease seemed to be virulent among the age groups regarded as the strongest and the most healthy. So if we were living during that time, you know, it's actually our age group. You know, the listeners right now, the, the students, coming from this age group, you know, 20 to 34 years of age, uh, those are the age groups that were really affected severely by the influenza virus. And why was the mortality peak among young adults during the 1918 to 1919 pandemic? And this graph showed to us clearly that you can appreciate here the W shape line, right? And that signifies that the mortality decreases in the pediatric age group. And then as they age from 15 to 24 and then going to 25 to 34, it would actually rise and peak, right? And this is where the mortality is very high. And then after that age, no, 20 to 32 or 20 to 34, it will go down. And then it will also plateau a little bit. And then suddenly at the age of around um, 74, 75, it will rise up again. All right. So what could be the possible explanations for this? Number one is the profound activation of cytokine storm among young adults. So in medicine, the cytokines would actually be an immunological response of your body to, in to infection. So usually, the cytokines are meant to protect us from infection. All right. However, for the case of influenza virus, it actually decreases the anti-inflammatory cytokines. No? And then it will promote now the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So there are two types of cytokines, the anti and the pro. So in this case, no, when, when the anti-inflammatory cytokines would decrease, no, what happened is that the pro-inflammatory cytokines will now increase or predominate. And once that the pro-inflammatory cytokines would increase, it will now damage and cause inflammation to the multiple organs of the body. And eventually, it will lead to shock, and then shock will lead to death. So that's the reason why among young adults, the death or the record for mortality would be higher compared to other age groups. 
The second explanation would be the previous exposure of 40 to 60 years old age group in previous 1889 pandemic. So this exposure had conferred a certain form of antibodies that would actually help them fight the infection. They may have infection, but the infection could be mild. And that's the reason why mortality is not that uh, plausible, right? So here we can see that the mortality among age 40 to 60 years of age, no, we can see in the graph that the mortality is actually not high. It actually plateaus no, on, during those age group. So we can see there that it's because of the previous exposure that most likely, that's the reason why most um, analysts believe that the 1918 to 1919 pandemic, the, the influenza virus was actually almost having the same structure uh, with the 1889 pandemic that happened before, all right? So next is the influenza virus. Well, we'll talk about the structure, okay? So here we can see that the influenza virus has a very unique um, round ball, spaghetti-like filaments. And you can see here that there are two important um, spikes no, or filaments that you can see here. Number one is the hemagglutinin, also called a sialidase. You can see here the spike here. And the other spike is what we call as neuraminidase. You can see here with the blue uh, color. And then with the yellow one is the hemagglutinin. So these spikes were actually important. They have important functions for the life cycle of the virus. So in this picture, we can see here the importance of hemagglutinin and neuraminidase in the viral replication of influenza. So first is the hemagglutinin. So hemagglutinin, the function of which is to bind to the target cell. So it means that the hemagglutinin is very important for the virus to attach, all right, to the host cell. So without hemagglutinin, there will be no attachment. From the term itself, hemagglutinin, it actually glues and tries to attach itself to the host cell. So if the hemagglutinin is defective, the virus cannot attached to the cell, right? So after successfully attaching to the cell, to the host cell, it will now undergo several processes until such time that the final process is for the virus to be released from the host cell for, for it to infect other cells of the body. So the one responsible for that is the neuraminidase. So this neuraminidase is the one responsible for the virus to be released from the host cell outside the host cell so that it will infect other cells of the body. So the neuraminidase is important for the cleaving of the receptor so that the virus will be released. All right, so that's the reason why the drugs that were developed in order to kill influenza virus is actually by acting against these two spikes, no? the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. So when you try to alter and try to damage the hemagglutinin or the neuraminidase, the influenza virus will not be able to complete its cycle. And therefore, the replication will stop. So the, vir the influenza virus will wane down and you were able to successfully uh, cure the patient. However, for, for this case, no, during the 1918 to 1919, there was no discovery yet of the vaccine. And in fact, during that time, they do not know yet about influenza virus. It was only years after, it was 1930 to 1935, that the influenza virus was identified. So during that time, they have no clues that it's actually the virus. No, They thought it was, bac it was bacterium, right? But a few years thereafter, it was realized that it was actually influenza virus, no? not bacteria. It's actually, a, it's actually virus. All right, so here uh, we can see in this graph the 1918 influenza pandemic, and we can see here the mortality peak, and then after a year, all right, it went down, and then finally, um, during the 1930 to 1935, as I mentioned, the influenza virus was identified, and years thereafter, the drugs no, that can help patient to be cured uh, for influenza was discovered, like adamantine and zanamivir. So which geographic area was severely affected by the influenza pandemic of 1918 to 1919? So it was actually the Africa 
which was actually the continent was one of the hardest hit con contents or continents of the pandemic. So the Caribbean was another region hit hard by the pandemic and the infection seems to have been most severe in the islands of Jamaica, Puerto Rico, and the mainland territories of Belize and Guyana. So the most well-studied regions of the pandemic was North America, and the disease moved rapidly over land and was introduced by sea to the Gulf and Pacific coast. Here in our place, no, Asia-Pacific region was actually the focal point of influenza virulence, and according to Patterson and Pyle, this region can be considered as the center of epidemiological mortality of the 1918 pandemic. So why was the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919 called Spanish influenza or Spanish flu. So the influenza pandemic was widely known as the Spanish influenza, despite the fact that it did not originate in Spain. The country of Spain allowed its press to publish reports on the spread of the epidemic within its territories, resulting in the disease being named as Spanish influenza. So that's the reason why you know, when, we, when we hear Spanish flu or Spanish influenza, we always think na baka galing yun sa Spain, kaya tinawag na Spanish flu, right? But in the history, it, it, does, it, it actually it did not originate in Spain. So, saan nga ba siya nagmula? No? So, most analysts suggest that the 1918 pandemic originated in the central areas of North America early in the spring of 1918. So, in the, in the North America, hindi siya sa Spain, all right? During March and April of that year, the disease spread from the American Midwest into parts of the South and military comes in various parts of the United States. So technically, it actually originated from North America in the Midwest of U.S. All right, so where did it, uh, where did the influenza pandemic originate? So troops of the American Expeditionary Forces probably carried this form of influenza to Europe during that spring. So, lumabas na siya, right? And then as the spring epidemic waned in the United States, an even more virulent form surfaced in the French port cities. And the disease quickly spread to other areas in Western Europe, Western Africa, South Asia, and other parts of the world starting from May of 1918. So, a lot of speculation said that it actually started around March or April. So, for the sake of simplicity, we will just pick April because that was also recorded. So April 1918 is the start. And then May, it actually spread now to different parts of the world like Europe, Africa, and Asia. So how many waves does the influenza pandemic uh, 1918 to 1919 have? So usually natin to that there are waves no, uh, during pandemic. And during that time, an important characteristic of the pandemic was its occurrence in waves of outbreaks, and there were identified three waves no, during that pandemic, and the first wave was on April to July of 1918, and then the second wave was October to November of 1918, third wave was February to March of 1919. And among these waves, it was actually the second wave, all right? Please take note of that. It was actually the second wave that caused the very high rates of mortality and morbidity in many parts of the world. So that's between late September or early October and the end of November. So ganun ka grabe yung nangyari. During the second wave, there was really a peak of mortality and a lot of people have died all over the world. Now, what could, what could have triggered the surge of cases in the second wave? So what's the difference between first, second, third? Why is it the second wave has the most number of mortality? It's actually because studies have shown that during this time, there was um, actually decrease in what we call in medicine as interferon beta. And this interferon beta is actually an anti-inflammatory cytokine. As I mentioned earlier, once you decrease the anti-inflammatory cytokines, there will be predominance of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what happened is that when there is predominance of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, there will be activation of too much cytokines causing inflammation to different organs of the body. And that will lead to multiple organ failure that will lead to shock and eventually death. So the cytokine storm was actually a dangerous um, immunological phenomenon 
because the immunology, um, the immunological response of the patient should have protected him against the infection. However, overactivation of cytokines, overactivation of this uh, defense mechanisms of the body against the virus can actually lead to cytokine storm and then eventually death. So let's just summarize everything. So the pro-inflammatory cytokines are the ones that will induce inflammation. And this is in response to tissue injury brought about by the virus. And the, conversely, the anti-inflammatory cytokines, the interleukin-4, uh, interleukin-10, interleukin-13, PGF-beta, and interferon-beta that we mentioned a while ago, those are the anti-inflammatory cytokines that would lower the inflammatory response. Remember, the virus would like to trigger inflammation. So that means that your body will try to control that okay, by producing anti-inflammatory cytokines. However, the virus will destroy and will lower down the interferon beta and other anti-inflammatory cytokines so that there will be predominance of the pro-inflammatory cytokines. So in a way, the defense of the body, the one that should have protected the body, was now going crazy, if, I may, if you will, no? if I may use the term. Now, instead of using their own function, which is to protect the body, right now it is now in the other way around no? because of the excessive production of the pro-inflammatory cytokines, leading now to cytokine storm and then eventually death. So what could have triggered? Another explanation would be the cytokine storm in greater detail would lead to clotting, all right? The clotting process can also lead to death. Cytokine storm can also lead to shock, lung injury, cell death, immune paralysis, and of course, renal failure. And all of these things uh, will actually ultimately lead to inflammation, organ failure, and infection, and then eventually death. So cytokine storm is a severe excessive immune response caused by a positive feedback cycle between cytokines and immune cells. The symptoms are high fever, redness, swelling, extreme fatigue, and nausea, which can be fatal. Cytokine storm is an important cause of acute respiratory distress syndrome, also known as ARDS, and multiple organ failure, also known as MOF. All right. So now we're done with the technicalities about the influenza pandemic in general, let's now focus on what happened in our country in the Philippines during this time. What are the struggles of the Filipino people during the influenza pandemic? So let's start with what really happened you know, in the Philippines during that time. So the pandemic exhibited the same virological and epidemiological characteristics in the Philippines as it did in the rest of the world. However, the, por the portrayal of the disease in effective quarantine, bureaucratic problems, no, military mobilization, and other factors no, made the experience of the influenza pandemic in the American-occupied Philippines historically peculiar. The admission by authorities of failure in combating the disease has yet to enter the historical assessments of public health during the American colonial period. So in other words, there were many factors that could have contributed to the sufferings of the Filipino people during this pandemic. And we're going to discuss it in details now, one by one. So let's have an overview of this. So an early medical report by the medical practitioner, Dr. Francis Cutant, who personally witnessed the contagion as it struck Manila during the first and second waves of the, of the epidemic or of the pandemic. Cases were first noted among longshoremen and other laborers along the waterfront near Manila sports, in the, um, indicating that it had been brought in from some other parts of the world. So that was actually the observation that it was actually coming, the first cases recorded were actually coming from patients who were actually um, working no, in the port area. So they have interaction with foreigners and with other um, fish, uh, uh, with other professionals no, coming from other countries. So here we can see uh, the estimated total deaths that happened during the pandemic of 1918 to 1919. So in the Philippines, there were 70,000 to 90,000 total deaths. That's actually 6.8 to 9.2 deaths per 1,000 population. And if you're going to realize and compare it no, as well, now it's COVID-19 pandemic, we can see that 
in the Philippines as of today while I was recording this, it's actually around 16,000 deaths, right? So it's very far, no? Coming from the pandemic na previously that happened in our country in, in 1918 to 1919, it's very far, right? And we can see that the immense gravity, that's why it's called the mother of all pandemics, because the deaths were really very high in comparison to other forms of pandemic. Now we can see here, uh, do you have a guess um, what area in the Philippines would be the most, um, what area in the Philippines have been most affected by this pandemic? So actually, uh, we will, you can think of it, maybe your guess is Manila, maybe. Or maybe you, you might be thinking Cebu, or maybe Davao, or maybe um, other areas, busy areas of the country. But during that time, um, actually, it's actually not the what I mentioned. No, It's not Manila that is the top one. It's not Cebu that is top one. It's not Davao. So let's now see. No? Tingnan natin kung tama yung guess that you have in your mind. What is the top one area in the Philippines or um, location in the Philippines that is actually uh, heavily affected by this pandemic. So top 10 and top 9 is Antique, the provinces of Antique and Nueva Ecija. Top 8 is Albay. Top 7 is Pampanga. Top 6 is Samar. Top 5 is Cebu. So it's not top 1, right? So top 5 is Cebu. Top 4 is Negros Occidental. Top 3 is Leyte. Top 2 is Iloilo. And then the top 1 so I think you have a guess now. And if you if your guess is Pangasinan, then you're correct. So the top one that is most affected or heavily affected by the influenza pandemic in our country way before, you know, in 1918 to 1919, was actually Pangasinan. And interestingly, the city of Manila had only seven people deaths, you no, know, seven people dead per 100,000, which is quite low compared to the provinces mentioned. So it is interesting, no, na bakit hindi Metro Manila. But um, actually, historically, it was really Pangasinan that was, had actually the highest rate of mortality uh, during the influenza pandemic. So I have seen this post by Pangasinan Youth for Disaster Risk Reduction and Management last year. And it says here, Pangasinan sa panahon ng pandemia. Bago ang COVID-19 nakaranas ng isang pandemya, ang Pangasinan. At hindi lang Pangasinan, kundi ang buong Pilipinas at ang buong mundo. Uh, however, in the Philippines, it was Pangasinan who was really severely affected with 83 deaths per 100,000. So nice to know, no? Uh, just to help us remember uh, this important fact. All right. So what are the causes of the spread and virulence of the influenza in the Philippines? So I'll just summarize it no, in a nutshell. I just organize it in such a way na maipapresent natin siya na, na in a summarized form because there are many causes why nagkaroon ng spread and virulence uh, of the influenza in the Philippines, but we will just limit it to just uh, of this, some of the important points. So number one is the personal shortage. Number two is the criticism against the administration. Number three is the failure in the system of quarantine stations. Number four, military mobilization campaigns. Number five, confined and concentrated populations. So we'll go in details. No? Number one is the personal shortage. Or personnel shortage, rather. So the, ex the exigencies of the First World War was made necessary. The deployment of many officers, including the Director of Health for the Philippine Islands, Dr. John D. Long, who was actually a surgeon. All right. Dr. Long resigned from his position effective December 3 of 1918, and this has paved the way for Vicente de Jesus to be the first Filipino to assume charge as acting director of health on January 1, 1919. So during this time, there was a um, shortage of personnel reached to a point as to threaten the organization operation of the health service as only a small number of personnel were forced to take the extra task left behind by the health practitioners. So during this time, it was really very difficult because they have very low manpower to help um, patients no, who are going through uh, this form of uh, illness no and during that time almost no doctors no hindi pa ganun kadami talaga ang mga doctors and absolutely um later we're going to see na instead of nurses there were other professions no who took the position of nurses um to help these patients another problem would be the criticism against the administration so uh, as we all know it was 
actually a Filipino who replaced the position of Dr. Long, who is actually um, a surgeon. And while the Filipino-led health service was experiencing the shortage of personnel, critics were united in laying the blame on the Philippine Filipinization of the program of then Governor General Francis Burton Harrison. And there were infamous political infighting among different colonial officials at the time of the change of colonial administration. It was Dean Worcester, for example, has described the conditions at the Philippine General Hospital as no longer a place fit for white patients. So he also said that the organization is incapable to deal with a dangerous communicable disease. So along with this uh, deficit or shortage in the number of manpower, the critics were trying to destroy the trust of the people and they were trying now to you know influence the people's minds na kulang talaga and there there could be incapacity to handle this kind of pandemic because of lack of people lack of preparation lack of skills and training that need to be um having no in order to respond effectively to this pandemic Another thing that caused the spread and virulence is the failure in the system of quarantine stations. So just like our pandemic today, um, they have instituted also quarantine measures to prevent the spread of this um, influenza virus. So the quarantine stations such as that established in Mariveles, in Bataan, in Cebu, in Ilo, still had increased number of infected cases. No? So the continuous rise of cases indicated the failure to check the entry of the disease and its spread in the archipelago. And quarantine procedures had failed to substantially safeguard the Filipino people from the virulent disease. So even though there were mga quarantine measures, no, there were ways to prevent this from spread. However, there was really a hard time to control the infection. And the mere fact that there were really a lot of Filipinos also who died from this pandemic. So it showed that the quarantine measures and the quarantine procedures were not that effective to control the spread of the virus. Another point is the military mobilization campaigns. Now, interestingly, during this time, Sa kalagitnaan ng pandemic, no, in September 1918, Governor General Harrison took formal, formal steps to organize the Philippine Council of National Defense with the cooperation of the U.S. Army Department of the Philippines and officers' training school was opened in Manila. And this was created in anticipation of the Philippines' participation in the First World War. So a three-month training course for these officers and troops were implemented but the troops were not fully mobilized to engage in actual com in the actual combat not until november 1 of 1918 so which means that the pandemic did not hinder the during the american colonization it did not hinder the officials to really prepare and to really do something to prepare the filipino uh, soldiers to prepare the defense of the country in preparation for the in anticipation for the First World War. So imagine, no, in the midst of pandemic, well, everything was unstable, everything was confusing, everything was really uncertain, wala kang kasiguraduhan na kung magiging maayos pa ba if everything is gonna be alright. But they still prioritize, no? doing the military mobilization, doing the three months training. Imagine in the midst of pandemic, you were training officers, you were training troops. Even though there's pandemic, you were trying to push forward for this advocacy to train uh, these officers in preparation for the First World War. So just imagine the gravity of the situation. And this has led, no, because of the training, because you are gathering together, you are crowded no you are you don't have social distancing of course and you are doing this training for three months and this from a public health perspective was actually dangerous and this mobilization has brought disastrous consequences from the perspective of public health because as a result no the concent of the concentration and crowding during the training because remember there's three months training and they were really doing this in the midst of the pandemic and there were a great number of people who got infected and in fact, on November 9 of 1918, 650 cases of the flu were reported with 162 patients with other medical conditions underwent treatment in the camp hospital. So ganun dumami tuloy yung cases no, that were infected. The concentration of men recruited from all over the archipelago in a single camp 
made the place a convenient breeding ground for the spread of the influenza virus. Which is very true, no? From a logical standpoint, na talagang it will really be disastrous, no? It will be detrimental, not just for for the health of the people there, but also from other people na nagkaroon sila, makakaroon sila ng exposure, no? Eventually, because they will be deployed to different provinces to do their job. So that's one of the reasons why it also spread no, to other areas of the country. Another thing is confined and concentrated populations. No? There are three uh, points I would like to share. The prisons, the leper colonies, and the schools. So the prisons during the time of influenza pandemic, in the case of the believed prisons, almost all of the inmates became sick of the disease. During the height of the pandemic, no second wave, no, if you remember, October no, uh, and November of 1918. Among those who develop respiratory complications, nearly half of inmates died. And in fact, no, and dami, 2,674 cases were reported and 71 of them had low bar pneumonia complications. Another point is the Kulyon. Okay, Kulyon, as you all know, is a safe refuge for, uh, as a treatment place for patients with leprosy. And Kulyon is found in the northern part of Palawan. And the Kulyon leper colony did not escape the contagion. Imagine, nandun na sila sa isang place wherein they are separated away from the society, no? from, the, um, from the cities. However, despite of it supposed to be well-quarantined conditions, they were still affected. For the first time in its history, an epidemic disease had reached the colony proper and the influenza entered the colony in October Not of 2018, it's a typographical error. I'm sorry for that. It's October of 1918 and took a toll of 216 lepers. So just imagine, ganun kadami yung patients with leprosy that were affected because the influenza virus has penetrated uh, their place. So the schools during the time of influenza pandemic, during this pandemic, many schoolhouses were used as temporary hospitals. Teachers received patients, cared for them, and taught others to care for them. As I mentioned kanina, di ba, wala naman talaga pang nurses, no? Uh, during that time, the nursing education was not that uh, established. And even for the doctors naman, there were very, very few doctors during that time. So hindi pa rin ganun kadami, no? Uh, in terms of the number of nurses and doctors, hindi pa talaga. It was not yet established and fully sufficient. And so the teachers uh, during that time ha- were actually doing the, the job of, a nur- of, uh, of nurses. No? So teachers received patients, cared for them, no? taught others to care for them. Hundreds of teachers spent the greater part of their time trying to save lives and helping to check the spread of the disease. So they helped by nursing the sick, no? distributing medicines, and giving helpful advice no? to people. So... In the University of the Philippines, no, uh, the University of the Philippines campus had to suspend registration for the second semester of the school year, 1918 to 1919, and a great number of professors and students were affected with three students who died of the disease. So what was the aftermath of all of these things, no, of the influenza pandemic? The official report of the health authorities assessed the impact of the epidemic concluded the following. So number one, the epidemic that ranged from May to July of 1919 was the grip, also called influenza, or here in the Philippines, it was called trancazo. And because of that, no, a lot of authors have believed na because they have used the term trancazo, it actually made the disease locally. Na there was really a point of view, a point in time wherein Uh, the Filipino people had acknowledged this to be coming from, originated from the local area, not from outside. While other societies had figured out that this was originating from other societies, from other places. However, in the Philippines, we use the term trancaso and, and it, uh, it has actually uh, created a sense of ownership with the disease. All right. And then second point is the disease had a preference for the age group between 10 and 29 years old. And so very, very similar, no? Dun sa napakita natin kanina na 20 to 32 years old, na talagang it actually affected the younger age group. So in the Philippines, it's 10 to 29. And the epidemic of, November, of October, rather, was merely a recrudescence and a continuation of the May to June pandemic. All right. 
So the fourth point is the attack of the influenza during the first period of the epidemic conferred immunity against another attack of the second. So they believe na the health authorities believe that the first wave you were exposed to that and this and during the second wave no uh, some people had been infected already from the first wave so they have conferred antibodies which actually allowed them to develop immunity against another attack of the second wave. So the epidemic was of autochthonous origin, so meaning it originated locally, but the importation of foreign strains increased the virulence of the native strains. So dito nagkakaiba yung uniqueness ng experience ng Filipino people of the pandemic. Many of them believe na it originated locally. That's why the term trangkazo was used no, by Filipino people. And unlike other societies, um, our society has failed to acknowledge na kumaga majority of the population failed to acknowledge that it actually originated outside, not not from our own place. No? So that's the reason why the author used the term autochthonous origin to describe this phenomenon. So the sixth point is the maritime and land quarantines, hospitalization, and the closing of schools and places of amusement failed to cut of the diffusion of the epidemic short. So kahit nagkaroon na ng mga pandem- ng, ng quarantines no, to control the pandemic, it was actually um, failed. No? It, was actually, it has actually failed to really decrease the, the severity no, of the spread of the virus. So let's come now to the final point of the discussion. What's the application of the influenza pandemic history in relation with today's pandemic? Because history is much appreciated when we try to connect it from our modern day um, situation. So the first application is that today's COVID-19 pandemic is comparably quote-unquote less severe in terms of mortality than the influenza pandemic. Comparing this to the influenza pandemic in 1918 to 1919 has recorded a total number of deaths of at least 50, 50 million, no, 50, 50 million, and in comparison with COVID-19 pandemic, as we all know, lagpas na tayo sa one year, right? Na from December 2019 to present, it has recorded a total number of deaths of only 3.1 million, which is computed as around 6.2% of 50 million. So that's very far. no? So I don't know if the COVID-19 pandemic will break this record, but I hope and pray it will not break the record of 50 million because 3.1 is still a lot of number. However, just for comparison, I just would like you to appreciate that our situation of pandemic right now is far better than the situation that they had in 1918. Just imagine if you lived during that time, diba? how will you feel? Or if you, have, if you were alive during 1918 pandemic and there were no vaccines there were no medications no there were no advancements in medicine yet so just imagine the difficulties of during that time there were there were no alcohol there were no face masks there were no surgical masks at all so the people were just trying to make their best out of what they have and just imagine that severity that's the reason why i said quote unquote less severe because in terms of mortality no um talagang mas grabe yung nangyari during the influenza pandemic all right so application uh, number 1 continues here naman sa locally kanina no international figure ito naman in the local statistics no in the philippines there were again 70,000 to 90,000 deaths in comparison as of Today, while I was recording this, it's actually the number of recorded deaths is 16,529. So just imagine that's far, far away from the uh, 1918 to 1919 pandemic. No, and layo naman ng 16,000 sa 70,000 to 90,000. And if you come to think of it, yung pandemic na naranasan nila was from um, April of 1918 to March of 1919 no so that's 12 months no and sa atin lagpas na tayong 1 year pero hindi naman tayo umabot sa 70,000 deaths to 90,000 deaths thank god no yun yung pwede nating ipagpasalamat pa din na hindi naman kasing grabe nung 1918 pandemic i hope you appreciate that part no na hindi hindi, na, hindi ko sinasabi na maganda ang sitwasyon natin ngayon but what i'm saying is that 
um, com- in comparison to the 1918 pandemic, we're on a better foot right now compared to the pandemic of the 1918. So here I just got a um, quotation from the WHO. Uh, Despite the challenges that we are all facing now due to COVID-19, we can still find purpose in our lives and be supportive of one another. When faced with a difficult situation, focus on what you can change, accept matters that are beyond your control, and always strive to live by your values. No, very important because sometimes we were overwhelmed by our fears. We forget that the opposite of fear is faith. And sometimes pag napuno na tayo ng takot, hindi na natin napapagano yung faith natin at yung ating sense of presence of mind because we were overwhelmed by anxieties. So I hope you can find hope no with this um, data that I'm showing to you na talagang in comparison to what our ancestors have experienced, we are on a better shoes right now with the advancement of medicine, support of vaccines and other um, preventive uh, measures no, uh, that are within our reach. We are more blessed no, compared to what they have experienced. Another application is the age group severely affected by the influenza pandemic is different with COVID-19 pandemic. Remember, during the influenza pandemic, the age group severely affected is 20 to 34 years of age. 20 to 34. However, for the COVID-19 pandemic, the group that is severely affected is 60 to 80 plus years of age because most likely they have more comorbidities. So just imagine... If you are listening right now sa mga viewers natin, if you are if you if your age belongs to 20 to 34 years of age, I think you should be thankful na hindi ka nabuhay nung 1918 because just imagine if you are uh, included in this age group, you are the ones that are more um Kumbaga, ikaw yung talaga more targeted, no? You are the ones that are more prone, more vulnerable to be infected by this virus. So let's us just be thankful no, na, na during this time, meron na tayong kahit pa paano, access to medicines and to vaccinations compared to their time. Okay, so the next part is, some, the application number three is that some Filipino people also perceived COVID-19 as trangkazo, similar to what happened in the influenza pandemic. Yun naman yung pagkakamuka. So the influenza pandemic said na, Talagang during that time, Filipinos believe na trangkaso yan, no? trangkaso yan. And it is, it is having the implication of autochthonous origin. So locally, yun ang, kanyang ini, yun ang iniisip ng mga uh, Filipinos before. Now, sa Filipinos natin na mabubuhay ngayon no? during this pandemic, it's still the same. No? Sometimes I, in my clinical practice, I have heard some of my patients would tell me na, uh, Doc, bak- bakit kailangan pang gawin ito yung ganyang mga precautions? Diba parang simpleng trangkaso lang naman yan? Yung COVID parang trangkaso lang yan. You often hear that. I know some of you may have heard that to some of your uh, kapitbahay or kakilala na binabaliwala nila ang COVID because they believe na it was just man-made and it was just simpleng trangkaso. Nagagaling din yung kusa. So because of this misconceptions, a lot of people had lowered down their guards to the point that some of them you may you may not see them wearing mask or wearing face shield because they believe na they are safe already because feeling nila trangkaso lang naman yan so pag dinapuan ka gagaling ka din however um it was not like that no however because of that phenomenon na meron tayong uh, pag-iisip no yung mga iba nating mga kababayan were trying to think na it was just a simple trangkaso so some of them had lowered down their guards. So that means the spread of the COVID-19 will continue because of this wrong misconceptions of other people. No, and some patients may think na, na parang ang COVID, hindi yan totoo, walang COVID. So yan ang kanilang paniniwala na, na ang COVID gawa-gawa lang yan, hindi yan totoo. So because of and that another misconception, no, uh, this will continue to... Um, create no difficulty for compliance and continual spread of COVID-19. So another thing is application number four is that quarantine measures were implemented in both pandemic, but there was none that inhibited its natural course. So in 1918 pandemic, nagkaroon ng quarantine stations, no? uh, we mentioned in different places in the Philippines. And same holds true today. Meron ding mga quarantine, pero we call it parang home quarantine 
or isolation hospital facilities. But same holds true. We performed our best to do quarantine procedures. However, none of these quarantines had fully, completely eradicated the transmission of the pandemic of the COVID-19 pandemic. Meron pa ding transmission. It may lessen the transmission, pero the mere fact na kumakalat pa rin at patuloy na nakakaroon ng infection no, in different places of the Philippines. So that means the quarantine measures both in both pandemic were not that effective. No? So application number five, there was shortage in the number of medical personnel, was, which was also the same issue that we have in COVID-19 pandemic, na nagkakaubusan ng doktor, nagkakaubusan ng mga nurses, ng mga medical staff na tutulong. So almost no doctors with only teachers who assume the role of nurses during the influenza pandemic. And now, even though we have doctors, nurses, and other professionals, pero still, kulang pa din, no? With the ongoing pandemic, we have, we, we have actually a low number of doctors and nurses who are uh, available no, to respond no, to this kind of need. So application number six, advancement of medical knowledge has paved the way for better management of pandemic. As we mentioned during the time, it was actually 1932, nandun lang na-identify yung influenza virus and the source of information was very limited. So it's very hard no, to treat a disease that you really don't see and you have no information at all. And the information that they lang sila was also a wrong information because eventually it was found that it was actually a virus, no, not bac not bacterium that uh, infected uh, a person, no, during that time. So. In the COVID-19 pandemic, we have a better understanding of medicine and behavior of microorganisms. So right now, we are on a better situation because of the advancements and because of the knowledge that our doctors have and nurses. So they are more now capable to handle uh, this kind of pandemic. Application number seven, the supply and availability of personal hygiene products were better today than the influenza pandemic. As I mentioned earlier, no surgical masks, no alcohol. <laughs> Imagine, protection and sanitation were often compromised kasi nga, wala pa talagang sufficient studies no, on how to handle such kind of pandemic. But now, uh, thankfully, we have available masks, alcohol, soap materials for hygiene and sanitation. But way before, they were really struggling, no? not unlike today. All right, so what is the take-home message? No? So number one, protect yourself from fake news. No? During this pandemic, hindi lahat ng nababasa natin sa internet ay totoo at tama. We have to consult a medical professional, a licensed medical professional, for us to really know na tama ba tong nababasa ko, Mamaya, mali naman pala, and a lot of information would sometimes cause fear na sa halip na guminhawa ka, kakabasa mo ng kakabasa kay Dr. Google. No? Sabi nga natin si Dr. Google, parang siya na yung nagiging takbuhan. Eh, no? na sometimes, instead of creating peace of mind, hindi lahat ng nababasa mo sa, sa web no? are accurate. So you have to really consult someone who is trained to do this someone who is licensed about this so that all of the information that you will get would be correct and accurate. Number two is the always be informed, no? but not to the point of paranoia and anxiety. So walang masamang mag-research ng libro, walang masamang magbasa ng journal. However, always be informed, pero do not sacrifice your mental health. So you have to also remember that anxiety and depression as well would be prevalent no in patients who are trying to uh, you know research on everything about their symptoms konting ubo lang konting uh, sipon no nagkakaroon na ng panic attacks yung iba nagkakaroon na ng paranoia episodes na they feel na meron na silang matinding sakit so always consult a medical doctor a medical professional when you when you have uh, when you are going through now uh, these kinds of symptoms next is um, next to cleanliness is godliness, of course. So, hindi lang naman sapat na naglilinis tayo ng bahay, no? naglilinis tayo ng kamay natin. We do sanitation of the house and we clean ourselves as well. But not only physically, but also spiritually. Because during this moment of pandemic, hindi lang naman physical battle ito. Eh. It's also a spiritual battle and also a mental health battle. We battle with the, with the depression, we battle with the anxiety, with fearful thoughts. 
coming over each other's minds, no? Na parang some of my patients, even in the clinic, would actually tell me na, Dok, mas gumrabi yung depression, mas gumrabi yung anxiety nung nag-start yung pandemic. And none of us are exempted from this. All of us may experience whether you are in a position of power or you're a strong person, walang pinipili ang depression, no? walang pinipili ang anxiety. You may be a potential um, someone na nakakaranas na pala ng ganito and you're just trying to hide it or just trying to pretending to be strong. But you have to acknowledge that you need a professional help. No? So it's very important na alagaan natin yung sarili natin mentally and spiritually. And also, disease perception will often determine people's response and feelings about the pandemic. So, kagaya ng nakita natin uh, sa pandemic ngayon, and even sa history, we can see that the behavior of Filipinos were affected by what they perceive. So, they perceive this is just trangkaso. This is just natural flu na gagaling din. So, nami-minimize yung gravity na to the point na hindi natuloy nakakapag-guard ng sarili, no? So, hindi na nakakapag-practice ng, ng hygiene no? and um, other health protocols. So, another one is end the pain but, not, but do not end your life. Okay. So, sometimes with this pandemic, I have encountered a lot of calls, no? a lot of my patients in the clinic no? for mental health services. Talagang I have seen... Um, increase in the number of calls with patients who are suicidal, no, having suicidal thoughts because of pandemic. And I just would like to point out here na pandemic will soon pass. No, I don't know when. I don't know how. But one thing is for sure, this will pass. And this will be uh, having its own end, no, its own exit, just like what happened in the influenza pandemic. I don't know when, but for sure, it will come to an end. So always remember that tomorrow... Soon, it will all be all right. No, we will go back to normal and things will be better. And that's um, another point that I want you to, to note. No? For us to not to you know, feel suicidal or not to think suicidal thoughts, one of the keys for you to overcome this is to master the habit of counting your blessings. The reason why some patients may feel suicidal is because they have been overdwelling, overthinking, and overfocusing on the negativities of life. They just have the negative view about themselves, negative view about the future, negative view about the world. And that's the reason why they have forgotten a very important habit, which is the habit of counting your blessings. There are times, nakakalimutan natin ipagpasalamat na buhay pa tayo. When was the last time that you say thank you, you're still breathing right now? When was the last time that you say thank you, that you can, you can walk, you can still move no you you still like wake up in the morning do you say thank you or do you just ignore this mundane or parang basic things in life that we have forgotten to acknowledge to be to be grateful and that is something na dapat wag nating makalimutan and if you're going through a hard time right now please seek for help because you cannot do it on your own you have to reach out for other people to help you especially for professionals who can handle your situation very well so please uh, reach out not only to the to the mental health professionals but also re reach out to other people to your family and I hope that hindi mo sarilinin yung problema na nararanasan mo right now. Always reach out and open to other who can be trusted. And also, it will also come to pass. <coughs> Excuse me. So, it will all come to pass. Remember that. Choose to live a life of happiness because it is a decision that, that only you can make. Okay? Kasi wala namang pipili ng happiness kundi ikaw din sa sarili mo. You have to choose happiness in spite of what is happening around you. Sasabihin mo, Dok, paano ko magiging masaya e pandemic nga? Di ba? Hindi ko nagagawa yung gusto ko. Na hindi ko magawa yung mga dati kong ginagawa. No? You know, people are designed to be flexible, to be resilient. No, we are not designed to be rigid. No, we have to learn how to adjust with the situation because we have to continue life and we have to choose happiness over these things. So always remember when you feel stuck, na parang hindi mo na alam if there's way out, always remember that there is still an exit, no? Na parang kahit feeling mo punong-puno na, na parang nakabingo ka na, hindi mo na kaya. But always remember to choose happiness and to reach out to other people. Remember, 
you are created to be resilient. No, you are created to withstand this pandemic. And you were created for such a time as this for a purpose. And uh, just to end no, this lecture forum, I would like to share to you Psalms 138 verse 8. It's a promise. It says here, the Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. So remember, the Lord will fulfill His purpose for us no, sa ating buhay. So pandemic will never hinder God's plan for your life. He has a very beautiful plan for you. And if you, if you will just trust Him and put your faith on Him that this pandemic will soon be over, you will be happy in life and you will have a positive outlook in life if you will try to just realize that there is someone up there watching over us, that he is still in control of everything, that he is still sovereign, that he knows what he's doing. He knows how to take care of you, even in the midst of pandemic. That's why even also he said that even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So why worry about the future? God will take care of you and he will send people who will also be with you and will take care of you. I really love this promise in Zechariah 9 verse 12. It says here, turn to the stronghold, turn to the stronghold you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. So the blessings of the Lord for your for your life will not be running out because he has thousands of ways to bless you. He has thousands of ways to put you on the right place at the right time. He has thousands of ways who uh, to really make you feel secure if you are having insecurities in life. So, hindi na ubusan, no? And ano man yung mga unfair situations that you have experienced in this pandemic, the promise of Zechariah 9 verse 12 says that the Lord will double it to you. So, times two sa mga sufferings na naranasan mo at this pandemic. And I would like to end with this promise in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, which is actually my favorite verse. And not only in this pandemic, but even... In a lifetime, ito talaga yung isa sa mga gusto kong verse. Ang sabi rito, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. So remember, tomorrow is another day. And I hope you will always take it to heart that tomorrow is gonna be a good, good day. Yes, tomorrow, maybe pandemic is still here. Maybe COVID-19 is still be present in the news. However, it will never stop God's plan for your life. No, It will never stop. No matter what your religion is, maybe uh, you have a different religion or maybe you have a different point of view. But remember, your creator is preparing a good future for you. Yes, a pandemic may seem to be dark, seem to be hopeless. But remember this, that just like what we mentioned, this too will pass. There will come a time that we will end, that this pandemic will end, And soon enough, no, even though hindi pa tapos ang pandemic, he has thousands of ways to bless you, even in the midst of pandemic, that you can thrive, you can prosper, you can do your God-given mission, even in this crucial time of pandemic. So I hope with this lecture forum, you were able to learn something new. And I hope I was able to connect with the today's pandemic and you were able to apply it no because um that's my goal for this lecture to you uh, for you to realize that uh, there's really something we can learn from history and history is not a boring subject because you can apply it to our present day and we can learn from the history so thank you so much for your time and god bless you all